Welcome to the hidden corners where truth and terror collide. Discover a realm where the lines between the living and the supernatural blur as you embark on a journey to the paranormal and visit the mysterious hidden corners of your mind. Chapter 17 The Slowing Rotation It might have been a million years later that I perceived, beyond possibility of doubt, that the fiery sheet that lit the world was indeed darkening. Another vast space went by, and the whole enormous flame had sunk to a deep copper color. Gradually it darkened from copper to copper red, and from this at times to a deep, heavy purplish tint, when, in it, a strange loom of blood. Although the light was decreasing, I could perceive no diminishment in the apparent speed of the sun. It still spread itself in that dazzling veil of speed. The world, so much of it as I could see, had assumed a dreadful shade of gloom, as though in very deed the last days of the world approached. The sun was dying, of that there could be little doubt, and still the earth whirled onward through space and all the eons. At this time I remember an extraordinary sense of bewilderment took me. I found myself later wandering mentally amid an odd chaos of fragmentary modern theories and the old biblical story of the world's ending. Then for the first time there flashed across me the memory that the sun with its system of planets was and has been, traveling through space at an incredible speed. Abruptly, the question rose. Where? For a very great time I pondered this matter, but finally, with a certain sense of the futility of my puzzlings, I let my thoughts wander to other things. I grew to wondering how much longer the house would stand. Also, I queried to myself whether I should be doomed to stay bodiless upon the earth, through the dark time when that I knew was coming. From these thoughts, I fell again to speculations upon the possible direction of the sun's journey through space, and so another great while passed. Gradually, as time fled, I began to feel the chill of a great winter. Then I remembered that with the sun dying, the cold must be necessarily extraordinarily intense. Slowly, slowly as the eon slipped into eternity, the earth sank into a heavier and redder gloom. The dull flame of the firmament took on a deeper tint, very somber and turbid. Then at last it was borne upon me that there was a change, the fiery, gloomy curtain of flame that hung quaking overhead, and down away into the southern sky began to thin and contract, and in it as one sees the fast vibrations of a jarred harp spring, I saw once more the sun stream quivering giddily north and south. Slowly the likeness to a sheet of fire disappeared and I saw plainly, the slowing beat of the sun stream, yet even then the speed of its swing was inconceivably swift, and all the time the brightness of the fiery arc grew ever duller. Underneath, the world gloomed dimly, an indistinct, ghostly region. Overhead, the river of flame swayed slower and even slower until at last. It swung to the north and south in great ponderous beats that lasted through seconds. A long space went by, and now each sway of the great belt lasted nigh a minute, so that after a great while I ceased to distinguish it as a visible movement, and the streaming fire ran in a steady river of dull flame across a deadly-looking sky. An indefinite period passed and it seemed that the arc of fire became less sharply defined. It appeared to me to grow more attenuated, and I thought blackish dreams showed occasionally. Presently, as I watched, the smooth onward flow ceased, and I was able to perceive that there came a momentary but regular darkening of the world. This grew until once more night descended in short, periodic intervals upon the wearying earth. Longer and longer became the nights, and the days equaled them, so that at last the day and the night grew to the duration of seconds in length, and the sun showed once more like an almost invisible, coppery-red-colored ball within the glowing mistiness of its flight. Corresponding to the dark line showing at times in its trail, there were now distinctly to be seen on the half-visible sun itself great dark belts. Year after year flashed into the past, and the days and nights spread into minutes. The sun has ceased to have the appearance of a tail and now rose and set, a tremendous globe of a glowing copper-bronze hue. Its parts ringed with blood-red hands and others with the dusky ones that I had already mentioned. These circles, both red and black, were of varying thicknesses. For a time, I was at a loss to account for their presence. Then it occurred to me that I was scarcely likely that the sun would cool evenly all over, and that these markings were due probably to differences in temperature of the various areas, the red representing those parts where the heat was still fervent, and the black those portions were already comparatively cool. It struck me as a peculiar thing that the sun should cool in evenly defined rings, 
until I remembered that possibly there were but isolated patches, to which the enormous rotatory speed of the sun had imparted a belt-like appearance. The sun itself was very much greater than the sun I had known in the old world days, and from this I argued that it was considerably nearer. At night, the moon still showed but small and remote, and the light she reflected was so dull and weak that she seemed little more than the small dim ghost of the olden moon that I had known. Gradually, the days and nights lengthened out, until they equaled the space somewhat less than one of the old earth hours, the sun rising and setting like a great ruddy bronze disc, crossed with ink-black bars. About this time I found myself able once more to see the gardens with clearness, for the world had now grown very still and changeless. Yet I am not correct in saying gardens, for there were no gardens, nothing that I knew or recognized. In place thereof, I looked out upon a vast plain stretching away into distance, a little to my left there was a low range of hills. Everywhere there was a uniform white covering of snow and places rising into hummocks and ridges. It was only now that I recognized how really great had been the snowfall. In places it was vastly deep as was witnessed by a great leaping waist-shaped hill away to my right. Though it is not impossible that this was due in part to some rise in the surface of the ground. Strangely enough, the range of low hills to my left already mentioned was not entirely covered with the universal snow. Instead, I could see their bare, dark sides showing in several places, and everywhere and always there reigned an incredible death, silence, and desolation. The immutable, always quiet of a dying world. All this time, the days and nights were lengthening perceptibly. Already each day occupied maybe some two hours from dawn to dusk. At night, I had been surprised to find that there were very few stars overhead, and these small, though of an extraordinary brightness, which I attributed to the peculiar but clear blackness of the nighttime. Away to the north, I could discern a nebulous sort of mistiness, not unlike in appearance, a small portion of the Milky Way. It might have been an extremely remote star cluster, or, the thought came to me suddenly, perhaps it was a side real universe that I had known, and now left far behind forever, a small, dimly glowing mist of stars far in the depths of space. Still, the days and nights lengthened slowly. Each time the sun rose duller than it had set, and the dark belts increased in breadth. About this time there happened a fresh thing. The sun, earth, and sky were suddenly darkened and apparently blotted out for a brief space. I had a sense, a certain awareness, I could learn little by sight, that the earth was enduring a very great fall of snow. Then in an instant, the veil that had obscured everything vanished and I looked out once more. A marvelous sight met my gaze. The hollow in which this house with its garden stands and with brim with snow. It lipped over the sill of my window. Everywhere it lay a great level stretch of white which caught and reflected gloomily the somber coppery glows of the dying sun. The world had become a shadowless plain from horizon to horizon. I glanced up at the sun. It shone with an extraordinary dull clearness. I saw it now as one who, until then, had seen it, only through a partially obscuring medium. All about it, the sky had become black with a clear, deep blackness, frightful in its nearness, and its unmeasured deep in its utter unfriendliness. For a great time, I looked into it newly and shaken and fearful. It was so near. Had I been a child, I might have expressed some of my sensation and distress by saying that the sky had lost its roof. Later, I turned and peered about me into the room. Everywhere, it was covered with a thin shroud of all pervading white. I could see it but dimly by reason of the somber light that now lit the world. It appeared to cling to the ruined walls and the thick soft dust of the years that covered the floor knee deep was nowhere visible. The snow must have blown it through the open framework of the windows. Yet in no place had it drifted but lay everywhere about the great old room, smooth and level. Moreover, there had been no wind these many thousand years, but there was the snow as I have told. And all the earth was silent. There was a cold such as no living man could have ever known. The earth was now illuminated by day with the most doleful light beyond my power to describe. It seemed as though I looked at the great plain through the medium of a bronze-tinted sea. It became evident that the earth's rotary movement was departing steadily. The end came all at once. The night had been the longest yet, and when the dying sun showed at last above the world's edge, I had grown so wearied of the dark that I greeted it as a friend. It rose steadily until about twenty degrees above the horizon. Then it stopped suddenly, and after a strange retrograde movement hung motionless, a great shield in the sky. Only the circular rim of the sun showed bright, only this and one thin streak of light near the equator. Gradually even this thread of light died out, 
and now all that was left out of our great and glorious sun was a vast dead disk, rimmed with a thin circle of bronze red light. Chapter 18 The Green Star The world was held in the savage gloom, cold and intolerable. Outside all was quiet. Quiet! From the dark room behind me came the occasional soft thud of a falling matter, fragments of rotting stone. So time passed and night grasped the world, wrapping it in wrappings of impenetrable blackness. There was no night sky as we know it. Even the few straggling stars had vanished conclusively. I might have been in a shuttered room without a light for all that I could see. Only in the impalpableness of the gloom opposite burnt that vast encircling hair of dull fire. Beyond this, there was no ray in the vastitude of night that surrounded me. Save that far in the north, that soft, mist-like glow still shone. Silently, years moved on. What period of time passed? I shall never know. It seemed to me waiting there that eternities came and went stealthily, and still I watched. I could see only the glow of the sun's edge at times, for now it had commenced to come and go, lighting up a while and again becoming extinguished. All at once, during one of those periods of life, a sudden flame cut across the night, a quick glare that lit up the dead earth shortly, giving me a glimpse of his flat lonesomeness. The light appeared to come from the sun, shooting out from somewhere near its center diagonally. A moment I gazed, startled, then the leaping flame sank and the gloom fell again. But now it was not so dark and the sun was belted by a thin line of vivid white light. I stared intently. Had a volcano broken out on the sun? Yet I negatived the thought as soon as it formed. I felt that the light had been far too intensely white and large for such a cause. Another idea there was that suggested itself to me. It was that one of the inner planets had fallen into the sun, becoming incandescent under that impact. This theory appealed to me as being more plausible and accounting more satisfactorily from the extraordinary size and brilliance of the blaze that had lit up the dead world so unexpectedly. Full of interest and emotion, I stared across the blackness, at that line of white fire cutting the night. One thing it told to me, unmistakably. The sun was yet rotating at an enormous speed. Thus I knew that the years were still fleeting at an incalculable rate, though so far as the earth was concerned, life and light and time were things belonging to a period lost in the long-gone ages. After that one burst of flame, the light had shone, only as an encircling band of bright fire. Now, however, as I watched, it began slowly to sink into a ruddy tint and later to a dark copper-red color, much as the sun had done. Presently it sank to a deeper hue, and in still further space of time it began to fluctuate, having periods of glowing and anon dying. Thus, after a great while, it disappeared. Long before this, the smoldering edge of the sun had deadened into blackness. And so, in that supremely future time, the world, dark and intensely silent, rode on its gloomy orbit around the ponderous mass of the dead sun. My thoughts of this period can be scarcely described. At first, they were chaotic and wanting in coherence. But later, as the ages came and went, my soul seemed to imbibe the very essence of the oppressive solitude and dreariness that held the earth. With this feeling, there came a wondrous clearness of thought, and I realized despairingly that the world might wander forever through that enormous night. For a while, the unwholesome idea filled me with a sensation of overbearing desolation, so that I could have cried like a child. In time, however, this feeling grew almost insensibly less, and an unreasoning hope possessed me. Patiently, I waited. From time to time, the noise of dropping particles beyond in the room came dully in my ears. Once I heard a loud crash and turned instinctively to look, forgetting for the moment the impenetrable night in which every detail was submerged. In a while, my gaze sought the heavens, turning unconsciously toward the north. Yes, the nebulous glow still showed, indeed. I could have almost imagined that it looked somewhat plainer. For a long time, I kept my gaze fixed upon it, feeling in my lonely soul that its soft haze was in some way a tide with the past. Strange, the trifles with which one can suck comfort. And yet had I but known, but I shall come to that in its proper time. For a very long space, I watched without experiencing any of the desire for sleep that would so soon have visited me in the old earth days. How I should have welcomed it if only to have passed time away from my perplexities and thoughts. Several times a comfortless sound of some great piece of masonry falling disturbed my meditations. And once I seemed I could hear whispering in the room behind me. Yet it was utterly useless to try and see anything. Such blackness as existed scarcely can be conceived. It was palpable and hideously brutal to the sense, as though something dead pressed up against me something soft and icily cold. 
Under all this, they grew up within my mind, a great and overwhelming distress of uneasiness that left me, but to drop me into an uncomfortable brooding. I felt that I must fight against it, and presently hoping to distract my thoughts, I turned to the window and looked up toward the north in search of the nebulous whiteness which still I believed to be the far and misty glowing of the universe we had left. Even as I raised my eyes, I was thrilled with the feeling of wonder for now. The hazy light had resolved into a single great star of vivid green. As I stared, astonished, the thought flashed into my mind that the earth must be traveling toward the star not away as I had imagined. Next, that it could not be the universe the earth had left, but possibly an outlying star, belonging to some vast star cluster hidden in the enormous depths of space. With a sense of commingled awe and curiosity, I watched it, wondering what new thing was to be revealed to me. For a while, vague thoughts and speculations occupied me, during which my gaze dwelt insatiably upon that one spot of light and the otherwise pit-like darkness. Hope grew up within me, banishing the oppression of despair that had seemed to stifle me. Whether the earth was traveling, it was at least going once more toward the realm of light. Light! One must spend an eternity wrapped in soundless night to understand the full horror of being without it. Slowly but surely, the stars grew upon my vision until in time, it shone as brightly as had the planet Jupiter in the old Earth days. With increased size, its color became more impressive, reminding me of a huge emerald scintillating rays of fire across the world. Years fled away in silence and the green star grew into the great splash of flame in the sky. A little later, I saw a thing that filled me with amazement. It was a ghostly outline of a vast crescent in the night, a gigantic new moon, seeming to be growing out of the surrounding gloom. Utterly bemused, I stared at it, it appeared to be quite close, comparatively, and I puzzled to understand how the Earth had come so near to it without my having seen it before. The light thrown by the star grew stronger, and presently I was aware that it was possible to see the Earthscape again, though indistinctly. A while I stared, trying to make out whether I could distinguish any detail of the world's surface, but I found the light insufficient. In a little, I gave up the attempt and glanced over once more toward the star. Even in the short space that my attention had been diverted, it had increased considerably and seemed now to be a bewildered sight, about the quarter of a size of the full moon. The light it threw was extraordinarily powerful, yet its color was so abominably unfamiliar that such of the world as I could see showed unreal. More as though I looked out upon the landscape of shadow than aught else. All this time the Great Crescent was increasing in brightness and began now to shine with a perceptible shade of green. Steadily the star increased in size and brilliancy until it showed fully as large as half a full moon. And as it grew greater and brighter, so did the vast crescent throw out more and more light, though of an ever-deepening hue of green. Under the combined blaze of the radiances, the wilderness that stretched before me became steadily more visible. Soon I seemed able to stare across the whole world, which now appeared beneath the strange light, terrible in its cold and awful flat dreariness. It was a little later that my attention was drawn to the fact that the great star of green flame was slowly sinking out of the north toward the east. At first, I could scarcely believe that I saw a right, but soon there could be no doubt that it was so. Gradually it sank, and as it fell, the vast crescents of glowing green began to dwindle and dwindle, until it became a mere arc of light against a livid-colored sky. Later it vanished, disappearing in the self-same spot from which I seen it slowly emerge. By this time, the star had come to within some thirty degrees of the hidden horizon. In size, it can now rival the moon at its full, though even yet it cannot distinguish its disk. This fact led me to conceive that it was still an extraordinary distance away, and this being so, I knew that its size must be huge beyond the conception of man to understand or imagine. Suddenly as I watched, the lower edge of the star vanished, cut by a straight dark line. A minute or a century passed, and it dipped lower until the half of it was disappeared from sight. Far away out on the great plain, I saw a monstrous shadow blotting it out, and advancing swiftly. Only a third of the star was visible now. Then, like a flash, the solution of this extraordinary phenomenon revealed itself to me. The star was sinking behind the enormous mass of the dead sun. Or rather, the sun, obedient to its attraction, was rising toward it, with the earth following in its trail. As these thoughts expanded into my mind, the star vanished, being completely hidden by the tremendous bulk of the sun. Over the earth there fell once more the brooding night. With the darkness came an intolerable feeling of loneliness and dread. For the first time, I thought of the pit and its inmates. After that, there rose in my memory the still more terrible thing that had haunted the shores of the Sea of Sleep, and lurked in the shadows of this old building. Where were they, I wondered, 
and shivered with miserable thoughts. For a time, fear held me and I prayed wildly and incoherently for some ray of light with which to dispel the cold blackness and envelop the world. How long I waited is impossible to say. Certainly for a very great period. Then all at once, I saw a loom of light shine out ahead. Gradually, it became more distinct. Suddenly, a ray of vivid green flashed across the darkness. At the same moment, I saw a thin line of livid flame far in the night. An instant, it seemed, and it had grown into a great clot of fire, beneath which the world lay bathed in a blaze of emerald green light. Steadily, it grew until presently the whole of the green star had come into sight again. But now it could be scarcely called a star, for it had increased to vast proportions, being incomparably greater than the sun had been in the olden time. Then as I stared, I became aware that I could see the edge of the lifeless sun, glowing like a great crescent moon. Slowly, its lighted surface broadened out to me until half of its diameter was visible, and the star began to drop away on my right. Time passed and the earth moved on, slowly traversing the tremendous face of the dead sun. Gradually, as the earth traveled forward, the star fell still more on the right, until at last it shone on the back of the house, sending a flood of broken rays in through the skeleton-like walls. Glancing upward, I saw that much of the ceiling had vanished, enabling me to see that the upper stories were even more decayed. The roof had evidently gone entirely, and I could see the green effulgence of the starlight shining in, slantily. Chapter 19 The End of the Solar System From the abutment where once had been the windows, through which I had watched that first fatal dawn, I could see that the sun was hugely greater than it had been when first the star lit the world. So great was it that its lower edge seemed almost to touch the far horizon. Even as I watched, I imagined that it drew closer. The radiance of green that lit the frozen earth grew steadily brighter. Thus, for a long space, things were. Then, on a sudden... I saw that the sun was changing shape and growing smaller. Just as the moon would have done in past time in a while, only a third of the illuminated part was turned toward the earth. The star bore away on the left. Gradually as the world moved on, the star shone upon the front of the house once more, while the sun showed only as a great bow of green fire. An instant, it seemed, and the sun had vanished. The star was still fully visible. Then the earth moved into the black shadow of the sun, and all was night. Night, black, starless, and intolerable. Filled with tumultuous thoughts, I watched across the night, waiting. Years it may have been. And then in the dark house behind me, the clotted stillness of the world was broken. I seemed to hear a soft padding of many feet, and a faint, inarticulate whisper of sound grew in my sense. I looked round into the blackness and saw a multitude of eyes. As I stared, they increased and appeared to come toward me. For an instant, I stood, unable to move. Then hideous swine noise rose up into the night, and at that I leapt from the window out onto the frozen world. I have a confused notion of having run a while, and after that I just waited, and waited. Several times I heard shrieks, but always as though from a distance. Except for these sounds, I have no idea of the whereabouts of the house. Time moved onward. I was conscious of little, save a sensation of cold, of hopelessness, and fear. At age, it seemed, and there came a glow that told of the coming light. It grew tardily. Then with a gloom of unearthly glory, the first ray from the green star struck over the edge of the dark sun and lit the world. It fell upon a great ruined structure some two hundred yards away. It was the house. Staring, I saw a fearsome sight. Over its walls crawled a legion of unholy things, almost covering the old building from tottering towers to base. I could see them plainly. They were the swine creatures. The world moved out into the light of the star and I saw that now it seemed to stretch across a quarter of the heavens. The glow of its livid light was so tremendous that it appeared to fill the sky with quivering flames. Then I saw the sun. It was so close that half of its diameter lay below the horizon, and as the world circled across its face, it seemed to tower right up into the sky, a stupendous dome of emerald-covered fire. From time to time I glanced toward the house, but the swine things seemed unaware of my proximity. Years appeared to pass slowly. The earth had almost reached the center of the sun's disk. The light from the green sun, as now must be called, shone through the interstices that gapped the moldered walls of the old house, giving them the appearance of being wrapped in green flames. The swine creatures still crawled about the walls. Suddenly there rose a loud roar of swine voices, and up to the center of the ruthless house shot a vast column of blood-red flame. I saw the little twisted towers and turrets flash into fire, 
yet still preserving their twisted crookedness. The beams of the green sun beat upon the house and intermingled with his lurid glows, so that it appeared a blazing furnace of red and green fire. Fascinated, I watched until an overwhelming sense of coming danger drew my attention. I glanced up, and at once it was borne upon me that the sun was closer. So close, in fact, that it seemed to overhang the world. Then, I know not how, I was caught up into strange heights, floating like a bubble in the awful effulgence. Far below me I saw the earth, with a burning house leaping into an ever-growing mountain of flame round about it. The ground appeared to be glowing, and in places heavy wreaths of yellow smoke ascended from the earth. It seemed as though the world were becoming ignited from that one plague spot of fire. Faintly I could see the swine things. They appeared quite unharmed. Then the ground seemed to cave in suddenly and the house with its load of foul creatures disappeared into the depths of the earth, sending a strange blood-colored cloud into the heights. I remember the hell pit under the house. In a while I looked round. The huge bulk of the sun rose high above me. The distance between it and the earth grew rapidly less. Suddenly, the earth appeared to shoot forward. In a moment I had traversed the space between it and the sun. I heard no sound. Out of the sun's face gushed an ever-growing tongue of dazzling flame. It seemed to leap almost to the existent green sun. Shearing through the emerald light, a very cataract of blinding fire. It reached its limit and sank, and on the sun glowed a vast splash of burning white, the grave of the earth. The sun was very close to me now. Presently I found that I was rising higher until at last I rode above it in the emptiness. The green sun was now so huge that its breath seemed to fill up all the sky ahead. I looked down and noted that the sun was passing directly beneath me. A year may have gone by, or a century, and I was left suspended, alone. The sun showed far in front, a black circular mass against the molten splendor of the great green orb. Near one edge I observed that a lurid glow had appeared, marking the place where the earth had fallen. By this I knew that the long dead sun was still revolving, though with great slowness. Afar to my right, I seemed to catch at times a faint glow of whitish light. For a great time, I was uncertain whether to put this down to fancy or not. Thus for a while, I stared with fresh wonderings, till at last, I knew that it was no imaginary thing, but a reality. It grew brighter, and presently there slid out of the green a pale globe of softest white. It came nearer, and I saw that it was apparently surrounded by a robe of gently glowing clouds. Time passed. I glanced toward the diminishing sun. It showed only as a dark blot on the face of the green sun. As I watched, I saw it grow smaller steadily, as though rushing toward the superior orb at an immense speed. Intently, I stared. What would happen? I was conscious of extraordinary emotions as I realized that it would strike the green sun. It grew no bigger than a pea, and I looked with my whole soul to witness the final end of our system. That system which had borne the world through so many eons with its multitude and its sorrows and joys. And now, suddenly... Something crossed my vision, cutting from sight all vestige of the spectacle I watched with such sole interest. What happened to the dead sun I did not see, but I have no reason, in the light of which I saw afterwards, to disbelieve that it fell into the strange fire of the green sun and so perished. And then suddenly an extraordinary question rose in my mind. Whether this stupendous globe of green fire might not be the vast central sun, the great sun round which our universe and countless others resolve. I felt confused. I thought of the probable end of the dead sun, and another suggestion came dumbly. Do the dead stars make the green sun their grave? The idea appealed to me with no sense of grotesqueness, but rather as something both possible and probable. Chapter 20 The Celestial Globes For a while, many thoughts crowded my mind, so that I was unable to do aught save stare blindly before me. I seemed whelmed in a sea of doubt and wonder and sorrowful remembrance. It was later that I came out of my bewilderment I looked about dazedly. Thus I saw so extraordinary a sight that for a while I could scarcely believe I was not still wrapped in the visionary tumult of my own thoughts. Out of the raining green had grown a boundless river of softly shimmering globes, each one enfolded in a wondrous fleece of pure cloud. They reached both above and below me to an unknown distance, and not only hid the shining of the green sun but supplied in place thereof, a tender glow of light that suffused itself around me, like unto nothing I had ever seen before or since. In a little I noticed that there was about these spheres a sort of transparency, almost as though they were formed of clouded crystal, 
within which burned a radiance gentle and subdued. They moved on past me continually, floating onward at no great speed, but rather as though they had eternity before them. A great while I watched and could perceive no end to them. At times I seemed to distinguish faces amidst the cloudiness, but strangely indistinct as though partly real and partly formed of the mistiness through which they showed. For a long time I waited passively with a sense of growing content. I had no longer that feeling of unutterable loneliness, but felt rather that I was less alone than I had been for the Kalpas of years. This feeling of contentment increased so that I would have been satisfied to float in company with these celestial globules forever. Ages slipped by, and I saw the shadowy faces, with increased frequency also with greater plainness. Whether this was due to my soul having become more attuned to its surroundings, I cannot tell. Probably it was so. But however this may be, I am assured now only of the fact that I have become steadily more conscious of a new mystery about me, telling me that I had indeed penetrated within the borderland of some unthought of region, some subtle, intangible place or form of existence. The enormous stream of luminous spheres continued to pass me at an unvarying rate, countless millions, and still they came, showing no signs of ending, nor even diminishing. Then as I was borne silently upon the unbuoying ether, I felt the sudden, irresistible forward movement toward one of the passing globes. An instant, and I was beside it. Then I slid through into the interior without experiencing the least resistance of any description. For a short while, I could see nothing and waited curiously. All at once, I became aware that a sound broke the inconceivable stillness. It was like the murmur of a great sea at calm, a sea breathing in its sleep. Gradually, the mist that obscured the sight began to thin away, and so in time my vision dwelt once again upon the silent surface of the sea of sleep. For a little I gazed and could scarcely believe I saw aright. I glanced round. There was the great globe of pale fire swimming as I had seen it before, a short distance above the dim horizon. To my left, far across the sea, I discovered presently a faint line as of thin haze, which I guessed to be the shore where my love and I had met during those wonderful periods of soul-wandering that had been granted to me in the old earth days. Another, a troubled memory, came to me of the formless thing that had haunted the shores of the Sea of Sleep, the guardian of that silent, echoless place. These and other details I remembered and knew, without doubt, that I was looking upon that same sea. With the assurance, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of surprise and joy and shaken expectancy, conceiving it possible that I was about to see my love again. Intently, I gazed around, but could catch no sight of her. At that, for a little, I felt hopeless. Fervently, I prayed, and never peered anxiously. How still was the sea? Down far beneath me, I could see the many trails of changeful fire that had drawn my attention formerly. Vaguely, I wondered what caused them. Also, I remembered that I had intended to ask my dear one about them, as well as many other matters, and I had been forced to leave her before the half that I wished to say was said. My thoughts came back with a leap. I was conscious that something had touched me. I turned quickly. God, thou wert indeed gracious. It was she. She looked up into my eyes with an eager longing and looked down to her with all my soul. I should like to have held her, but the glorious purity of her face kept me afar. Then out of the winding mist she put her dear arms. Her whisper came to me, soft as the rustle of a passing cloud. Dearest, she said. That was all. But I had heard, and in a moment I held her to me as I prayed forever. In a little she spoke of many things, and I listened. Willingly would I have done so through all the ages that are to come. At times I whispered back, and my whispers brought to her spirit face once more. An indescribably delicate tint, the bloom of love. Later I spoke more freely, and to each word she listened and made answer delightfully, so that already I was in paradise. She and I, and nothing, save the silent spacious void to see us and only the quiet waters of the sea of sleep to hear us. Long before, the floating multitude of cloud and folded spears had vanished into nothingness. Thus we looked upon the face of the slumberous deeps, and were alone. Alone, God, I would be thus alone in the hereafter, and yet be never lonely. I had her, and greater than this, she had me. I, eon aged me, and on this thought and some others. I hope to exist through the few remaining years that may yet lie between us. Chapter 21 The Dark Sun How long our souls lay in the arms of joy I cannot say, but all at once I was waked from my happiness by a diminution of the pale and gentle light that lit the sea of sleep. 
I turned toward the huge white orb with a premonition of coming trouble. One side of it was curving inward, as though a convex black shadow were sweeping across it. My mind went back. It was thus that the darkness had come before our last parting. I turned toward my love, inquiringly. With a sudden knowledge of woe, I noticed how wan and unreal she had grown, even in that brief space. Her voice seemed to come to me from a distance. The touch of her hands was no more than the gentle pressure of a summer wind, and grew less perceptible. Already, quite half of the immense globe was shrouded. A feeling of desperation seized me. Was she about to leave me? Would she have to go as she had gone before? I questioned her anxiously, frighteningly, and she, nestling closer, explained in that strange, faraway voice that it was imperative she should leave me, before the son of darkness, as she termed it, blotted out the light. At this confirmation of my fears, I was overcome with despair. I could only look voicelessly across the quiet plains of the silent sea. How swiftly the darkness spread across the face of the wide orb. Yet in reality, the time must have been long beyond human comprehension. At last, only a crescent of pale fire lit the now dim sea of sleep. All this while, she had held me. But was so soft a caress that I had been scarcely conscious of it. We waited there together, she and I, speechless, for very sorrow. In the dimming light, her face showed shadowy, blending into the dusky mistiness that encircled us. Then, when a thin curved line of soft light was all that lit the sea, she released me, pushing me from her tenderly. Her voice sounded in my ears. I must not stay longer, dear one. It ended in a sob. She seemed to float away from me and became invisible. Her voice came to me out of the shadows faintly, apparently from a great distance. A little while, it died away remotely. In a breath, the sea of sleep darkened into night. Far to my left, they seemed to me, for a brief instant, a soft glow. It vanished, and in the same moment, I became aware that I was no longer above the still sea, but once more suspended in infinite space, with the green sun now eclipsed by a vast dark spear before me. Utterly bewildered, I stared almost unseeingly at the ring of green flames leaping above the dark edge. Even in the chaos of my thoughts, I wondered dully at their extraordinary shapes. A multitude of questions assailed me. I thought more of her I had so lately seen than of the sight before me. My grief and thoughts of the future filled me. Was I doomed to be separated from her, always? Even in the old earth days, she had been mine, only for a little while. Then she had left me as I thought forever. Since then, I had seen her but these times upon the sea of sleep. A feeling of fierce resentment filled me in miserable questionings. Why could I not have gone with my love? What reason to keep us apart? Why had I to wait alone while she slumbered through the years, on the still bosom of the sea of sleep? A sea of sleep. My thoughts turned inconsequently, out of the channel of bitterness to fresh, desperate questionings. Where was it? Where was it? I seemed to have but just parted with my love upon its quiet surface. And had it gone utterly, it could not be far away. And the wide orb which I had seen hidden in the shadow of the sun of darkness. My sight dwelt upon the green sun, eclipsed. What had eclipsed it? Was there a vast dead star circling it? Was the central sun, as I had come to regard it, a double star? The thought had come almost unbidden. Yet why should it not be so? My thoughts went back to the wide orb. Strange that it should have been. I stopped. An idea had come suddenly. The wide orb and the green sun. Were they one and the same? My imagination wandered backward and I remembered the luminous globe to which I had been so unaccountably attracted. It was curious that I should have forgotten it ever momentarily. Where were the others? I reverted again to the globe I had entered. I thought for a time and matters became clearer. I conceived that by entering the impalpable globule, I had passed at once into some further and until then invisible dimension. There the green sun was still visible, but as a stupendous sphere of pale white light, almost as though its ghost showed and not its material part. A long time I mused on the subject. I remembered how, on entering the sphere, I had immediately lost all sight of the others. For a still further period, I continued to resolve the different details in my mind. In a while, my thoughts turned to other things. I came more into the present and began to look about me, seeingly. For the first time, I perceived that innumerable rays of a subtle violet hue pierced the strange semi-darkness in all directions. 
They radiated from the fiery rim of the green sun. They seemed to grow upon my vision so that, in a little, I saw that they were countless. The night was filled with them, spreading outward from the green sun, fanwise. I concluded that I was unable to see them by reason of the sun's glory being cut off by the eclipse. They reached right out into space and vanished. Gradually, as I looked, I became aware that fine points of intensely brilliant light traversed the rays. Many of them seemed to travel from the green sun into distance. Others came out of the void toward the sun, but one and all each kept strictly to the ray in which it traveled. Their speed was inconceivably great, and it was only when they neared the green sun or as they left it that I could see them as separate specks of light. Further from the sun they became thin lines of vivid fire within the violet. The discovery of these rays and the moving sparks interested me extraordinarily. To where did they lead in such countless profusion? I thought of the worlds in space, and those sparks, messengers. Possibly the idea was fantastic, but I was not conscious of its being so. Messengers, messengers from the central sun. An idea evolved itself slowly. Was the green sun the abode of some vast intelligence? The thought was bewildering. Visions of the inevitable rose vaguely. Had I indeed come upon the dwelling place of the Eternal? For a time I propelled the thought dumbly. It was too stupendous. Yet, huge, vague thoughts had birth within me. I felt suddenly terribly naked, and an awful nearness shook me. And heaven! Was that an illusion? My thoughts came and went erratically. The sea of sleep and she. Heaven, I came back with a bound to the present. Somewhere, out of the void behind me, there rushed an immense dark body, huge and silent. It was a dead star hurling onward to the burying place of the stars. It drove between me and the central suns, blotting them out from my vision and plunging me into an impenetrable night. At age, and I saw again the violet rays. A great while later, eons it must have been, a circular glow grew in the sky ahead, and I saw the edge of the receding star show darkly against it. Thus I knew that it was nearing the central suns. Presently I saw the bright ring of the green sun, Shown plainly against the night, the star had passed into the shadow of the dead sun. After that, I just waited. The strange years went slowly and ever I watched intently. The thing I had expected came at last. Suddenly, awfully. A vast flare of dazzling light. A streaming burst of white flame across the dark void. For an indefinite while, it soared outward. Gigantic mushroom of fire. It ceased to grow. Then as time went by, it began to sink backward slowly. I saw now that it came from a huge glowing spot near the center of the dark sun. Mighty flames still soared outward from this. Yet in spite of its size, the grave of the star was no more than the shining of Jupiter upon the face of an ocean, when compared with the inconceivable mass of the dead sun. I may remark here once more that no words will ever convey to the imagination the enormous bulk of the two central suns. Chapter 22 the Dark Nebula. Years melted into the past, centuries, eons. The light of the incandescent star sank to a furious red. It was later that I saw the Dark Nebula, at first an impalpable cloud away to my right. It grew steadily to a clot of blackness in the night. How long I watched it is impossible to say, for time as we count it was a thing of the past. It came closer, a shapeless monstrosity of darkness, tremendous. It seemed to slip across the night sleepily, a very hell fog. Slowly it slid nearer and passed into the void between me and the central suns. It was as though a curtain had been drawn before my vision. A strange tremor of fear took me, and a fresh sense of wonder. The green twilight that had reigned for so many millions of years had now given place to impenetrable gloom. Motionless I peered about me. A century fled and it seemed to me that I detected occasional dull glows of red, passing me at intervals. Earnestly, I gazed and presently seemed to me circular masses that showed muddily red within the clouded blackness. They appeared to be growing out of the nebulous murk. A while, and they became plainer to my accustomed vision. I could see them now with a fair amount of distinctness. ruddy tinged spheres similar in size to the luminous globes that I had seen so long previously. They floated past me continually. Gradually, a peculiar uneasiness seized me. I became aware of a growing feeling of repugnance and dread. It was directed against those passing orbs and seemed born of intuitive knowledge, rather than any real cause or reason. 
Some of the passing globes were brighter than others, and it was from one of these that a face looked suddenly. A face, human in its outline, but so tortured with woe that I stared aghast. I had not thought that there was such sorrow as I saw there. I was conscious of an added sense of pain of perceiving that the eyes which glared so wildly were sightless. A while longer I saw it. Then it had passed on into the surrounding gloom. After this I saw others, all wearing that look of helpless sorrow and blind. A long time went by and I became aware that I was nearer to the orbs than I had been. At this I grew uneasy, though I was less in fear of those strange globules than I had been before seeing those sorrowful inhabitants. For sympathy had tempered my fear. Later there was no doubt that I was being carried closer to the red spheres, and presently I floated among them. In a while I perceived one bearing down upon me. I was helpless to move from its path. In a minute it seemed it was upon me and I was submerged in a deep red mist. This cleared and I stared confusedly across the immense breadth of the plain of silence. It appeared just as I had first seen it. I was moving forward steadily across its surface. Away ahead shone the vast blood red ring that lit the place. All around was spread the extraordinary desolation of stillness that had so impressed me during my previous wanderings across its darkness. Presently I saw, rising up in the ruddy gloom, the distant peaks of the mighty amphitheater of mountains, where untold ages before, I had been shown my first glimpse of the terrors that underlie many things, and where vast and silent watch by a thousand mute gods stands a replica of this house of mysteries, this house that I had seen swallowed up in that hellfire, ere the earth that kissed the sun and vanished forever. Though I could see the crest of the mountain amphitheater, yet it was a great while before their lower portions became visible. Possibly this was due to the strange ruddy haze that seemed to cling to the surface of the plain. However, be this as it may, I saw them at last. In a still further space of time, I had come so close to the mountains that they appeared to overhang me. Presently, I saw the great rift open before me and I drifted into it, without volition on my part. Later, I came out upon the breadth of the enormous arena. There, at an apparent distance of some five miles, stood the house, huge, monstrous, and silent, lying in the very center of that stupendous amphitheater. So far as I could see, it had not altered in any way, but looked as though it were only yesterday that I had seen it. Around, the grim, dark mountains frowned down upon me from their lofty silences. Far to my right, way up among inaccessible peaks, loomed the enormous bulk of the great beast god. Higher, I saw the hideous form of the dread goddess, rising up through the red gloom, thousands of fathoms above me. To the left, I made out the monstrous eyeless thing, gray and inscrutable. Further off, reclining on its lofty ledge, the livid ghoul shape showed, a splash of sinister color among the dark mountains. Slowly, I moved out across the great arena, floating. As I went, I made out the dim forms of many of the other lurking horrors that peopled these supreme heights. Gradually, I neared the house, and my thoughts flashed back across the abyss of years. I remember the dread specter of the place. A short while passed, and I saw that I was being walted directly toward the enormous mass of that silent building. About this time, I became aware, and in a different sort of way, of a growing sense of numbness that robbed me of the fear, which I should otherwise have felt on approaching that awesome pile. As it was, I viewed it calmly, much as a man's views calamity through the haze of his tobacco smoke. In a little while, I'd come so close to the house as to be able to distinguish many of the details about it. The longer I looked, the more was I confirmed in my long-ago impressions of its entire similitude to this strange house. Save in its enormous size, I could find nothing unlike. Suddenly, as I stared, a great feeling of amazement filled me. I had come opposite to that part where the outer door leading into the study is situated. There, lying right across the threshold, lay a great length of coping stone, identical, save in size and color, with the piece I had dislodged in my fight with the pit creatures. I floated nearer, and my astonishment increased as I noted that the door was broken partly from its hinges precisely in the manner that my study door had been forced inward by the assaults of those swine things. The sight started a train of thoughts, and I began to trace dimly that the attack on this house might have a far deeper significance than I had hitherto imagined. I remembered how long ago in my old earth days I had half suspected that in some unexplainable manner this house in which I lived was in report, to use a recognized term, with that other tremendous structure away in the midst of that incomparable plain. Now, however, it began to be borne upon me that I had but vaguely conceived what the realization of my suspicion meant. I began to understand with a more than human clearness that the attack I had repelled was, in some extraordinary manner, 
connected with an attack upon that strange edifice. With a curious inconsequence, my thoughts abruptly left the matter, to dwell wonderingly upon the peculiar material out of which the house was constructed. It was, as I have mentioned earlier, of a deep green color, yet now that I had come so close to it, I perceived that it fluctuated at times though slightly, glowing and fading much as do the fumes of phosphorus when rubbed upon the hand in the dark. Presently, my attention was distracted from this by coming to the great entrance. Here, for the first time, I was afraid. For all in a moment, the huge door swung back, and I drifted in between them, helplessly. Inside, all was blackness, impalpable. In an instant, I had crossed the threshold and the great doors closed silently, shutting me in that lightless place. For a while, I seemed to hang motionless, suspended amid the darkness. Then I became conscious that I was moving again, where I could not tell. Suddenly, far down beneath me, I seemed to hear a murmurous noise of swine laughter. It sank away, and the succeeding silence appeared clogged with horror. Then a door opened somewhere ahead. A white haze of light filtered through, and I floated slowly into a room that seemed strangely familiar. All at once, there came a bewildering screaming noise that deafened me. I saw a blurred vista of visions flaming before my sight. My senses were dazed, though the space of an internal moment. Then my power of seeing came back to me. The dizzy, hazy feeling passed, and I saw clearly. Chapter 23 Pepper I was seated in my chair, back again in this old study. My glance wandered round the room. For a minute, it had a strange, quivery appearance, unreal and unsubstantial. This disappeared, and I saw that nothing was altered in any way. I looked toward the end window. The blind was up. I rose to my feet shakily. As I did so, a slight noise in the direction of the door attracted my attention. I glanced toward it. For a short instant, it appeared to me that it was being closed, gently. I stared and saw that I must have been mistaken. It seemed closely shut. With a succession of efforts, I trod my way to the window and looked out. The sun was just rising, lighting up the tangled wilderness of gardens. For perhaps a minute, I stood and stared. I passed my hand confusedly across my forehead. Presently, amid the chaos of my senses, a sudden thought came to me. I turned quickly and called the pepper. There was no answer, and I stumbled across the room in a quick access of fear. As I went, I tried to frame his name, but my lips were numb. I reached the table and stooped down to him with the catching of my heart. He was lying in the shadow of the table, and I had not been able to see him distinctly from the window. Now as I stooped, I took my breath shortly. There was no pepper. Instead, I was reaching toward an elongated little heap of gray ash-like dust. I must have remained in a half stooped position for some minutes. I was dazed, stunned. Pepper had really passed into the land of shadows. Chapter 24 The Footsteps in the Garden Pepper's dead. Even now at times, I seem scarcely able to realize that this is so. It is many weeks since I came back from that strange and terrible journey through space and time. Sometimes in my sleep I dream about it and go through in an imagination the whole of that fearsome happening. When I wake, my thoughts dwell upon it. That sun, those suns, were they indeed the great central suns round which the whole universe and the unknown heavens revolves? Who shall say? And the bright globules floating forever in the light of the green sun, and the sea of sleep on which they float. How unbelievable it all it is. If it were not for Pepper, I should, even after the many extraordinary things that I had witnessed, be inclined to imagine that it was but a gigantic dream. Then there is that dreadful dark nebula, with its multitudes of red spears, moving always within the shadow of the dark sun, sweeping along on its stupendous orbit, wrapped eternally in gloom. And the faces that peered out at me. God, do they, and does such a thing really exist? There is still that little heap of gray ash on my study floor. I will not have touched. At times, when I am calmer, I have wondered whether it became of the outer planets of the solar system. It has occurred to me that this may have broken loose from the sun's attraction and whirled away into space. This, of course, only a surmise. There are so many things about which I wonder. Now that I am writing, let me record that I am certain there is something horrible about to happen. Last night a thing occurred, which filled me with an even greater terror than did the pit fear. I will write it down now. And if anything more happens, endeavor to make a note of it at once. I have a feeling that there is more in this last affair than in all those others. 
I am shaky and nervous even now as I write. Somehow I think death is not very far away. Not that I fear death, as death is understood. Yet there is that in the air which bids me fear, an intangible cold horror. I felt it last night. It was thus. Last night I was sitting here in my study, writing. The door leading into the garden was half open. At times a metallic rattle of a dog's chain sounded faintly. It belongs to the dog I have bought since Pepper's death. I will not have him in the house, not after Pepper. Still, I have felt it better to have a dog about the place. They are wonderful creatures. I was much engrossed in my work and the time passed quickly. Suddenly I heard a soft noise in the path outside in the garden. Pat, 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 it went, with a stealthily curious sound. I sat upright with a quick movement and looked out through the open door. Again the noise came. Pat, pat, pat. It appeared to be approaching. With a slight feeling of nervousness, I stared into the gardens, but the night hid everything. Then the dog gave a long howl and I started. For a minute perhaps I peered intently, but could hear nothing. After a little, I picked up the pen which I had laid down and recommenced my work. The nervous feeling had gone, for I imagined that the sound I had heard was nothing more than the dog walking around his kennel at the length of his chain. A quarter of an hour may have passed, then all at once the dog howled again, and with such a plaintively sorrowful note that I jumped to my feet, dropping my pen, and inking the page on which I was at work. Curse that dog, I muttered, noting what I had done. Then even as I said the words, there sounded again that queer, pat, pat, pat. It was horribly close, almost by the door, I thought. I knew now that it could not be the dog. His chain would not allow him to come so near. The dog's growl came again and I noticed subconsciously the taint of fear in it. Outside on the windowsill I could see Tip, my sister's pet cat. As I looked, it sprang to his feet and his tail swelling visibly. For an instant it stood thus, seeming to stare fixedly at something in the direction of the door. Then quickly it began to back along the sill until, reaching the wall at the end, it could go no further. Then it stood rigid as though frozen in an attitude of extraordinary terror. Frightened and puzzled, I seized a stick from the corner and went toward the door silently taking one of the candles with me. I had come to within a few paces of it when suddenly, a peculiar sense of fear thrilled through me. A fear palpitant and real whence I knew not, nor why. So great was the feeling of terror that I wasted no time but retreated straightway, walking backward and keeping my gaze fearfully on the door. I would not have given much to rush at it, fling it to, and shoot the bolts, for I have had it repaired and strengthened so that now it is far stronger than it has ever been. Like Tip, I continued my almost unconscious progress backward until the wall brought me up. At that, I started nervously and glanced around, apprehensively. As I did so, my eyes dwelt momentarily on the rack of firearms, and I took a step toward them but stopped, with a curious feeling that they would be needless. Outside the gardens, Dog moaned strangely. Suddenly from the cat, there came a fierce long screech. I glanced jerkedly in its direction. Something luminous and ghostly encircled it and grew upon my vision. It resolved into a glowing hand, transparent with a lambent greenish flame flickering over it. The cat gave a last awful caterwaul, and I saw its smoke and blaze. My breath came with a gasp, and I leant against the wall. Over that part of the window there spread a smudge, green and fantastic. It hit the thing from me, though the glare of fire shone through dully. A stench of burning stole into the room. Pat, pat, pat. Something passed down the garden path and a faint, moldy odor seemed to come in through the open door and mingled with a burnt smell. The dog had been silent for a few moments. Now I heard him yowl sharply as though in pain. Then he was quiet, save for an occasional subdued whimper of fear. A minute went by. Then the gate on the west side of the garden slammed instantly. After that, nothing. Not even the dog's whine. I must have stood there some minutes. Then a fragment of courage stole into my heart, and I made a frightened rush at the door, dashed it to and bolted it. After that, for a full half hour, I sat helpless, staring before me rigidly. Slowly, my life came back into me, and I made my way shakily upstairs to bed. That is all. Chapter 25 The Thing from the Arena This morning, early, I went through the gardens, but found everything as usual. Near the door, I examined the path for footprints. Yet here again, there was nothing to tell me whether or not I dreamed last night. It was only when I came to speak to the dog that I discovered tangible proof that something did happen. When I went to his kennel, he kept inside, crouching up in one corner, and I had to coax him to get him out. 
when finally he consented to come. It was in a strangely cowed and subdued manner. As I patted him, my attention was attracted to a greenish patch on his left flank. On examining it, I found that the fur and skin had been apparently burnt off, for the flesh showed raw and scorched. The shape of the mark was curious, reminding me of the imprint of a large talon or hand. I stood up thoughtful. My gaze wandered toward the study window. The rays of the rising sun shimmered on the smoky patch in the lower corner, causing it to fluctuate from green to red, oddly. Ah, that was undoubtedly another proof. It's only a horrible thing I saw last night rose in my mind. I looked at the dog again. I knew the cause now of that hateful-looking wound on his side. I knew also that what I had seen last night had been a real happening, and a great discomfort filled me. Pepper, Tip, and now this poor animal. I glanced at the dog again, and noticed that he was looking at his wound. You poor brute, I muttered, and bent to pat his head. At that, he got upon his feet, nosing and licking my hand wistfully. Presently, I left him, having other manners to which to attend. After dinner, I went to see him again. He seemed quiet and disciplined to leave his kennel. From my sister, I have learned that he has refused all food today. She appeared a little puzzled when she told me, though quite unsuspicious of anything of which to be afraid. The days passed uneventfully enough. After tea, I went again to have a look at the dog. He seemed moody and somewhat restless, yet persisted in remaining in his kennel. Before locking up for the night, I moved his kennel out away from the wall, so I should be able to watch her from the small window tonight. The thought came to me to bring him into the house for the night, but consideration has decided me to let him remain out. I cannot say that the house is, in any degree, less to be feared than the gardens. Pepper was in the house, and yet... <sighs> it is now two o'clock. Since eight, I had watched the kennel from the small side window of my study. Yet nothing has occurred, and I am too tired to watch longer. I will go to bed. During the night, I was restless. This is unusual for me, but toward morning I had tamed a few hours sleep. I rose early, and after breakfast visited the dog. He was quiet but morose, and refused to leave his kennel. I wish there was some horse doctor near here. Out of the poor brute looked to. All day he has taken no food, but has shown an evident desire for water, lapping it up greedily. I was relieved to observe this. The evening has come, and I am in my study. I intend to follow my plan of last night and watch the kennel. The door leading into the garden is bolted securely. I am consciously glad that there are bars to the windows. Night. Midnight has gone. The dog has been silent up to the present. Through the side window on my left, I can make out dimly the outlines of the kennel. For the first time, the dog moves, and I hear the rattle of the chain. I look out quickly. As I stare, the dog moves again, restlessly, and I see a small patch of luminous light shine from the interior of the kennel. It vanishes, then the dog stirs again, and once more the gleam comes. I am puzzled. The dog is quiet, and I can see the luminous thing plainly. It shows distinctly. There is something familiar about the shape of it. For a moment I wonder that it comes to me, that it is not unlike the four fingers and thumb of a hand. Like a hand. And I remember the contour of that fearsome wound on the dog's side. It must be the wound I see. It is luminous at night. Why? The minutes pass. My mind is filled with this fresh thing. Suddenly I hear a sound out in the gardens. How it thrills through me. It is approaching. Pat, pat, pat. A prickly sensation traverses my spine and seems to creep across my scalp. The dog moves in his kennel and whimpers frightenedly. He must have turned round, for now I can no longer see the outline of a shining moon. Outside, the gardens are silent, once more, and I listen fearfully. A minute passes, and another. Then I hear the padding sound again. It is quite close and appears to be coming down the graveled path. The noise is curiously measured and deliberate. It ceases outside the door, and I rise to my feet and stand motionless. From the door comes a slight sound, the latch is being slowly raised. A singing noise is in my ears, and I have a sense of pressure about the head. The latch drops with a sharp click and into the catch. The noise startles me afresh, jarring horribly on my tense nerves. After that I stand for a long while amid an ever-growing quietness. All at once my knees begin to tremble, and I have to sit quickly. An uncertain period of time passes, and gradually I begin to shake off the feeling of terror that had possessed me. Yet still I sit. I seem to have lost the power of movement. I am strangely tired and inclined to doze. My eyes open and close and presently I find myself falling asleep and waking in fits and starts. 
It is some time later that I am sleepily aware that one of the candles is guttering. When I wake again, it has gone out, and the room is very dim under the light of the one remaining flame. The semi-darkness troubles me little. I have lost that awful sense of dread, and my only desire seems to be to sleep. Suddenly, although there is no noise, I am awake, wide awake. I am acutely conscious of the nearness of some mystery, of some overwhelming presence. The very air seems pregnant with terror. I sit huddled and just listen intently. Still, there is no sound. Nature herself seems dead. Then the oppressive stillness is broken by a little eldritch scream of wind that sweeps around the house and dies away remotely. I let my gaze wander across the half-lighted room. By the great clock in the far corner is a dark, tall shadow. For an instant, I stare frightenedly. Then I see that it is nothing and am momentarily relieved. In the time that follows, a thought flashes through my brain. Why not leave this house? This house of mystery and terror. Then as though an answer, there sweeps up across my sight a vision of the wondrous sea of sleep. The sea of sleep where she and I had been allowed to meet after the years of separation and sorrow. And I know that I shall stay on here, whatever happens. Through the side window, I note the somber blackness of the night. My glance wanders away and round the room resting on one shadowy object and another. Suddenly I turn and look at the window on my right. As I do so, I breathe quickly and bend forward with a frightened gaze at something outside the window, but close to the bars. I am looking at a vast misty swine face, over which fluctuate a flamboyant flame of a greenish hue. It is a thing from the arena. The quivering mouth seems to drip with a continual phosphorescent slaver. The eyes are staring straight into the room with an inscrutable expression. Thus I sit rigidly, frozen. The thing had begun to move. It is turning slowly in my direction. Its face is coming around towards me. It sees me. Two huge, inhumanly human eyes are looking through the dimness at me. I am cold with fear, yet even now I am keenly conscious and noted in a reverent way that the distant stars are blotted out by the mass of the giant face. A fresh horror has come to me. I am rising from my chair without the least intention. I am on my feet and something is impelling me toward the door that leads out into the gardens. I wish to stop, but cannot. Some immutable power is opposed to my will, and I go slowly forward, unwilling and resistant. My glance flies round the room helplessly and stops at the window. The great swine face has disappeared, and I hear again that stealthy pat, pat, pat. It stops outside the door, the door toward which I am being compelled. There succeeds a short, intense silence. Then there comes a sound. It is the rattle of the latch being slowly lifted. At that I am filled with desperation. I will not go forward another step. I make a vast effort to return, but it is as though I press back upon an invisible wall. I groan out loud in the agony of my fear, and the sound of my voice is frightening. Again comes that rattle and I shiver clamily. I try, I fight and struggle to hold back, back, but it is no use. I am out the door, and in a mechanical way I watch my hand go forward to undo the topmost bolt. It does so entirely without my volition. Even as I reach up toward the bolt, the door is violently shaken and I get a sickly whiff of moldy air, which seems to drive in through the interstices of the doorway. I draw the bolt back slowly, fighting dumbly the while. It comes out of its socket with a click and I begin to shake anguishly. There are two more, one at the bottom of the door, the other a massive affair is placed about the middle. For perhaps a minute I stand with my arm hanging slackly by my sides. The influence to metal with the fastenings of the door seem to have gone. All at once there comes a sudden rattle of iron at my feet. I glance down quickly and realize with an unspeakable terror that my foot is pushing back the lower bolt. An awful sense of helplessness assails me. The bolt comes out of its hole with a slight ringing sound and I stagger on my feet, grasping at the great central bolt for support. A minute passes, an eternity, then another. My god, help me. I'm being forced to work upon the last fastening. I will not. Better to die than open to the terror that is on the other side of the door. Is there no escape? God help me, I have jerked the bolt half out of its socket. My lips emit a hoarse scream of terror. The bolt is in three parts drawn now, and still my unconscious hands work toward my doom. Only a fraction is still between my soul and that. Twice I scream out in the supreme agony of my fear. Then with a mad effort, I tear my hands away. My eyes seem blinded, a great blackness is falling upon me. Nature has come to my rescue. I feel my knees giving. There is a loud, quick thudding upon the door and I am falling. Falling. I must have lain there at least a couple of hours. 
As I recover, I am aware that the other candle is burnt out, and the room is in an almost total darkness. I cannot rise to my feet, for I am cold and filled with a terrible cramp. Yet my brain is clear, and there is no longer the strain of that unholy influence. Cautiously, I get upon my knees, and feel for the central bolt. I find and it pushes securely back into its socket, then the one at the bottom of the door. By this time, I am able to rise to my feet, and so manage to secure the fastening at the top. After that, I go down upon my knees again and creep away among the furniture in the direction of the stairs. By doing this, I am safe from observation from the window. I reach the opposite door, and as I leave the study, catch one nervous glance over my shoulder toward the window. Out in the night, I seem to catch a glimpse of something impalpable, but it may only be a fancy. Then, I am in the passage and on the stairs. Reaching my bedroom, I clamber into bed, all clothed as I am, and pull the bedclothes over me. Then after a while, I begin to regain a little confidence. It is impossible to sleep, but I am grateful for the added warmth of the bedclothes. Presently, I try to think over the happenings of the past night, but though I cannot sleep, I find that it is useless to attempt consecutive thought. My brain seems curiously blank. Toward morning, I begin to toss uneasily. I cannot rest, and after a while, I get out of bed and pace the floor. The wintry dawn is beginning to creep through the windows and shows the bare discomfort of the old rooms. Strange that through all these years it has never occurred to me how dismal the place really is. And so a time passes. From somewhere downstairs a sound comes up to me. I go to the bedroom door and listen. It is Mary bustling about the great old kitchen, getting the breakfast ready. I feel little interest. I am not hungry. My thoughts, however, continue to dwell upon her. How little the weird happenings in this house seem to trouble her. Except that in the incident of the pit creatures, she has seemed unconscious of anything unusual occurring. She is old like myself, yet how little we have to do with one another. Is it because we have nothing in common, or only that being old we care less for society than quietness? These and other matters pass through my mind as I meditate, and help to distract my attention for a while from the oppressive thoughts of the night. After a while, I go to the window, and opening it, look out. The sun is now above the horizon, and the air, though cold, is sweet and crisp. Gradually, my brain clears and a sense of security for the time being comes to me. Somewhat happier, I go downstairs and out into the garden to have a look at the dog. As I approach the kennel, I am greeted by the same moldy scent that assailed me at the door last night. Shaking off a momentary sense of fear, I call to the dog, but he takes no heed. After calling once more, I throw a small stone into the kennel. At this, he moves uneasily, and I shout his name again, but do not go closer. Presently, my sister comes out and joins me in trying to coax him from the kennel. In a little, the poor beast rises, and shambles out lurching queerly. In the daylight, he stands swaying from side to side and blinking stupidly. I look and know that the horrid wound is larger, much larger, and seems to have a whitish, fungoid appearance. My sister moves to fondle him, but I detain her, and explain that I think it will be better not to go near him for a few days, as it is impossible to tell what may be the matter with him, and it is well to be cautious. A minute later, she leaves me, coming back with a basin of odd scraps of food. This she places on the ground near the dog, and I push into his reach, with the aid of a branch broken from one of the shrubs. Yet though the meat should be tempting, he takes no notice of it but retires to his kennel. There is still water in his drinking vessel, so after a few moments' talk, we go back to the house. I can see that my sister is much puzzled as to what is the matter with the animal, yet it would be madness even to hint the truth to her. The days slip away uneventfully, and night comes on. I have determined to repeat my experiment of last night. I cannot say that it is wisdom, yet my mind is made up. Still, however, I have taken precautions, for I have driven stout nails into the back of each of the three bolts, and secured the door, opening from the study into the gardens. This will at least prevent a recurrence of the danger I ran last night. From ten to about two-thirty I watch, but nothing occurs. And finally, I stumble off to bed, where I am soon asleep. Chapter 26 The Luminous Speck I awake suddenly. It is still dark. I turn over once or twice in my endeavors to sleep again, but I cannot sleep. My head is aching slightly, and by turns I am hot and cold. In a little I give up the attempt and stretch out my hand for the matches. I will light my candle and read a while. Perhaps I should be able to sleep after a time. For a few moments I grope, then my hand touches the box, but as I open it, I am startled to see a phosphorescent speck of fire shining amid the darkness. 
I put out my other hand and touch it. It is on my wrist. With a feeling of vague alarm, I strike a light hurriedly and look, but can see nothing save a tiny scratch. Fancy, I mutter with a half sigh of relief. Then the match burns my finger and I drop it quickly. As I fumble for another, the thing shines out again. I know now that it is not fancy. This time, I light the candle and examine the place more closely. There is a slight greenish discoloration around the scratch. I am puzzled and worried. Then a thought comes to me. I remember the morning after the thing appeared. I remember that the dog licked my hand. It was this one with the scratch on it. Though I have not been even conscious of the abasement until now. A horrible fear has come to me. It creeps into my brain. The dog's wound shines at night. With a dazed feeling, I sit down on the side of the bed and try to think, but cannot. My brain seems numb with the sheer horror of this new fear. Time moves on unheeded. Once I rouse up and try to persuade myself that I am mistaken, but it is no use. In my heart, I have no doubt. Hour after hour, I sit in the darkness in silence and shiver hopelessly. The day has come and gone, and it is night again. This morning, early, I shot the dog and buried it, away among the bushes. My sister is startled and frightened, but I am desperate. Besides, it is better so. The foul growth had almost hidden its left side, and I, the place on my wrist had enlarged perceptibly. Several times I have caught myself muttering prayers, little things learned as a child. God, almighty God, help me. I shall go mad. Six days and I have eaten nothing. It is night, I am sitting in my chair. Ah, oh, God. I wonder have I ever felt the horror of life that I have come to know. I am swathed in terror. I feel ever the burning of this dread growth. It has covered all my right arm and side and is beginning to creep up my neck. Tomorrow, it will eat into my face. I shall become a terrible mass of living corruption. There is no escape. Yet a thought has come to me, born of a sight of the gun rack on the other side of the room. I have looked again, with the strangest of feelings. The thought grows upon me. God, thou knowest, thou must know that death is better, I, better a thousand times than this. This! Jesus, forgive me, but I cannot live. Cannot. Cannot. I dare not. I am beyond all help. There is nothing else left. It would at least spare me that final horror. I think I must have been dozing. I am very weak and, oh, so miserable. So miserable and tired. Tired. The rustle of the paper tries my brain. My hearing seems prenaturally sharp. I will sit a while and think. Hush. I hear something down, down in the cellars. It is a creaking sound. My God, it is the opening of the great oak trap. What can be doing that? The scratching of my pen deafens me. I must listen. There are steps in the stairs, strange padding steps that come up and nearer. Jesus, be merciful to me, an old man. There is something fumbling at the door handle. Oh, God, help me now. Jesus, the door is opening. Slowly. Something. That is all. Chapter 27 Conclusion I put down the manuscript and glanced across at Tonneson. He was sitting, staring out into the dark. I waited a moment, then I spoke. Well? I said. He turned slowly and looked at me. His thoughts seemed to have gone out of him into a great distance. Was he mad? I asked, and indicated the manuscript with a half nod. Tonneson stared at me unseeingly a moment. Then his wits came back to him, and suddenly, he comprehended my question. No, he said. I opened my lips to offer a contradictory opinion, for my sense of the saneness of things would not allow me to take the story literally. Then I shut them again, without saying anything. Somehow the certainty in Tonneson's voice affected my doubts. I felt all at once less assured, though I was by no means convinced as yet. After a few moments' silence, Tonneson rose stiffly and began to undress. He seemed disinclined to talk, so I said nothing but followed his example. I was weary, though still full of the story I had just read. Somehow as I rolled in my blankets, there crept into my mind a memory of the old gardens as we had seen them. I remembered the odd fear that the place had conjured up in our hearts, and grew upon me with the conviction that Tonneson was right. It was very late when we rose, nearly midday, for the greater part of the night had been spent in reading the manuscripts. Tonneson was grumpy and I felt out of sorts. It was a somewhat dismal day and there was a touch of chilliness in the air. There was no mention of going out fishing on either of our parts. We got dinner, and after that just sat and smoked in silence. Presently, Tonneson asked for the manuscript. 
I handed it to him, and he spent most of the afternoon reading it through by himself. It was while that he was thus employed that a thought came to me. What do you say to having another look at it? Uh, I nodded my head downstream. Tonneson looked up. Nothing, he said abruptly, and somehow I was less annoyed than relieved at his answer. After that, I left him alone. A little before tea time, he looked up at me curiously. Hey, sorry, old chap. If I was a bit short with you just now. Just now, indeed, he had not spoken for the last three hours. But I would not go there again. And he indicated with his head. For anything that you would cut off from me. Ugh. And he put down that history of a man's terror and hope and despair. The next morning, we rose early and went for our accustomed swim. We had partly shaken off the depression of the previous day, and so took our rods when we had finished breakfast, and spent the day at our favorite sport. After that day, we enjoyed our holiday to the utmost, though both of us looked forward to the time when our driver should come, for we were tremendously anxious to inquire of him, and through him among the people of the tiny hamlet whether any of them could give us information about that strange garden, lying away by itself in the heart of an almost unknown tract of country. At last the day came on which we expected the driver to come across for us. He arrived early while we were still a bet, and the first thing he knew he was at the opening of the tent inquiring whether we had good sport. We replied in the affirmative and then both together, almost in the same breath. We asked the question that was uppermost in our minds. Did he know anything about an old garden and a great pit and a lake situated some miles away down the river? Also, had he ever heard of a great house thereabouts? No, he did not, and had not yet to stay. He had heard a rumor once upon a time of a great old house standing alone out in the wilderness. But if you remember rightly, it was a place given over to the fairies. Or if that had not been so, he was certain that there had been something queer about it. And anyway, he had heard nothing of it for a very long while. Not since he was quite a gossoon. No, he could not remember anything particular about it indeed. He did not know he remembered anything at all, until we questioned him. Look here, said Tonneson, finding that this was about all that he could tell us. Just take a walk around the village while we dress and find out something if you can. With a nondescript salute, the man departed on his errand, while we made haste to get into our clothes, after which we began to prepare breakfast. We were just sitting down to it when he returned. No, oh, well, sit down, replied my friend, and have something to eat with us, which the man did without delay. After breakfast, Tonneson sent him off again on the same errand while we sat and smoked. He was away for some three quarters of an hour, and when he returned, it was evident that he had found out something. It appeared that he had got into conversation with an ancient man of the village who probably knew more, though it was little enough, of the strange house than any other person living. The substance of this knowledge was that in this ancient man's youth, and goodness knows how long back that was, there had stood a great house in the center of the gardens, where now was left only the fragment of ruin. This house had been empty for a great while, years before his, the ancient man's birth. It was a place shunned by the people of the village as it had been shunned by their fathers before them. There were many things said about it, and all were of evil. No one ever went near it, either by day or night. In the village it was a synonym of all that is unholy and dreadful. And then one day a man, a stranger, had ridden through the village and turned off down the river, in the direction of the house, as it was always termed by the villagers. Some hours afterwards he had ridden back, taking the track by which he had come, toward Erjahan. Then for three months or so nothing was heard. At the end of that time he reappeared, but now he was accompanied by an elderly woman, and a large number of donkeys laden with various articles. They passed through the village without stopping and gone straight down the bank of the river in the direction of the house. Since that time, no one, save the man whom they had chartered to bring over monthly supplies of necessaries from Adrahan, had ever seen either of them. And him, none had ever induced to talk, evidently. He had been well paid for his trouble. The years had moved onward uneventfully enough in that little hamlet, the man making his monthly journeys regularly. One day he had appeared as usual on his customary errand. He had passed through the village without exchanging more than a surly nod with the inhabitants and gone on towards the house. Usually it was evening before he made the return journey. On this occasion, however, he had reappeared in the village a few hours later in an extraordinary state of excitement, and with the astounding information that the house had disappeared bodily and that a stupendous pit now yawned in the place where it had stood. This news, it appeared, so excited the curiosity of the villagers that they overcame their fears and marched en masse to the place. There they found everything, just as described by the carrier. This is all that we could learn. Of the author of the manuscript, who he was and whence he came, we shall never know. 
His identity is, as he seems to have desired, buried forever. That same day, we left the lonely village of Creighton. We had never been there since. Sometimes in my dreams, I see that enormous pit surrounded as it is, on all sides by wild trees and bushes. And the noise of the water rises upwards and blends in my sleep, with other and lower noises, while over all hangs the eternal shroud of spray. <laughs>